I'm Michael Turner. I'm a cosmologist at the University of Chicago. Uh -huh. And have you ever seen a UFO? Um, I don't think I have, not to my knowledge. <laughs> and have you ever been abducted by an alien? Uh, if so, they erased all the memories. Uh -huh. So it could be that you were abducted. abducted. Well, you know, I'm a scientist, so you, scientists don't like to ever say never, right? You know, so because we always come up with these really weird scenarios where, well, I could have been abducted, and then you know, if they're that advanced, they could erase the memories. And, yes. And uh, but uh, yeah, no, n no memories of it. But are you an alien? Um, some people would call me an alien. <laughs> All right, but uh, you but don't. I do have a birth certificate, and so you uh, don't self-identify as an alien. I don't self-identify as an alien. <laughs> now, how about this big picture? I, I talked to Sean Carroll earlier, and he's writing a book called The Big Picture. How important is the big picture? Why is it important? Why should the man in the street care, and most people don't care? Is that is that right? Or well, I think most people do care. Um, people want to know how did we get here. Uh, where are we going? Are we alone? I think we all want to know our place, uh, have a sense of our place uh, in the universe. And so I think, you know, I mean, if you look at this historically, every society has had a story about how, how we got here and where we're going. And we're no different, uh, but ours is scientific. And uh, the virtue of a scientific story is it, while it's never complete, you can organize it into, I like to organize things into three buckets, what we know absolutely for sure, not going away. Uh, I call this knocking at the door, stuff that we're trying to establish, and then uh, wild-ass speculation. And so in science, we start with ideas. And some of them are crazy and really aren't true. Some of them are crazy enough to be true, and then we put them in this bucket knocking at the door and then some subset then becomes what we really know about the universe and so the scientific creation story is a little bit different because it's never complete um, but as it evolves the stuff we know for sure if we're doing our job right that doesn't change well if the stuff that if the stuff we're doing our job right doesn't change tells us that we're meaningless and that the whole reason that we're looking for a, a, an origin myth is undermined by this meaninglessness, I mean, that would tell me that we should stop doing it and just be happy with the, you know, the myths that we make up about ourselves. Well, yeah, meaningless. Uh, so scientists don't do meaning. Well, do uh, they? I'm not to ask you, do they? Well, I don't think... Um, I think, you know, my vision of science, it's extraordinarily powerful. It's the most powerful technique that we've ever uh, developed to explore the physical world, to explain the physical world. And I, I like to make the analogy, because this really gets people's attention, that scientists are like plumbers. So we are, you know, I don't know uh, here in Australia, but uh, in the U.S., if you need a plumber, you need a plumber. And they're very good at what they do. But, you know, if, if you're having trouble training your dog, or if you're having psychological issues, a plumber is not going to help you. Mm -hmm. And so we're very good at what we do, which is to figure out uh, how the universe runs. Uh, we don't do who, you, who runs the universe. Uh, meaning? I mean, I, I'm, I'm having trouble. I mean, as a personal, you know. Well, you've, certainly you've had students come into your office and say, yeah, I want to do cosmology, but I'm, you know, I'm desperate. I feel like my life has no meaning. Cosmology, that's for you. Oh, I, no, I actually haven't had uh, such people. I mean, I think it, I remember the first time I read an astronomy book. So I started out in particle physics, and then I uh, uh, needed to learn a little bit of astrophysics. And so I read cover to cover one of these general astronomy books. Um, and uh, boy, was I depressed. Why? Well, because we're so small, you know. Uh, oh, how big did you think you were? Well, you don't think about it normally. You look at the sky, there are a lot of stars, uh, millions that you can see with the naked eye. I guess you can see millions. Uh, but in our own galaxy, we know there are 100 billion stars, and then there are 100 billion galaxies, and you start doing the numbers. And so if meaningfulness comes, um, if meaning comes from being special, uh, maybe we are special. Maybe we're the only place where there's intelligent life in the universe. Okay, uh, so let me ask you a question. Are we alone? Um, 
I suspect not. And you, uh, why? What are your speculations based on? Well, it, it looks like, uh, you know, the conditions for forming life uh, exist in other places. Uh, it looks like... You mean the ingredients? Um, you know, where you have liquid water and you have a source of energy like a star. And, you know, what we found is that uh, on average, each star has a couple of planets. Uh, maybe it's only one, but it, you know, uh, the number of, uh, of planets like Earth is very big. The number in the, uh, in the habitable zone is very big. And when you look at uh, what led to life on Earth, there, there's no, no suggestion that anything was uh, special. We still don't know how it originated. It could have originated on Mars and then come here. could have originated outside the solar system and come here. But it, 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 uh, all of those things suggest that life uh, is very common. Okay, so let me stop you there. Um, the ingre- so you're arguing that the ingredients and the conditions for life are common, and I'd agree with that. But you could also ask the question, well, what about the English language? The ingredients and the conditions for the English language you know, maybe there are they everywhere? And people say, oh, no, that's a quirky thing. You wouldn't expect English to, the aliens to be speaking English. And so is there a distinction to be made in your mind between something as quirky as a language and maybe life is as quirky as that? Um, I, I think the quirky thing comes into play when you start talking about intelligent life because that's what we're really interested in. I think most people are really interested in. And that's where I think the question gets really rich in so many different ways. So one way the question gets rich is, so, um, and we'll we'll know in the next 30 years whether there's life somewhere else in the universe. Uh, And, but the really interesting question is how common is intelligent life? And then uh, an interesting question to me, I don't know if it's interesting to the, you know, biologists is, is intelligence a, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a convergent property of evolution. Mm-hmm. So if you did a bunch of evolution experiments, uh, so thinking like a physicist, you did a bunch of these experiments uh, on identical planets or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, would intelligent life evolve? And you could imagine, because uh, when you think about what evolution is all about, it's all about dominating the resources. You know, organisms need to get the resources, and, the, and it's a battle for the resources, and you could imagine that, you know, the universe is teeming with life, and it's mostly slime molds that cover the planet and are very good at uh, absorbing all the resources and filling all the niches. And that may be too simplistic, but the, the idea uh, that intelligent life is common, that I don't know. I mean, Martin Rees and others, uh, actually he's not alone, is that... It could be that intelligent life is very, very rare. Well, the experiments that you've mentioned, multiple planets... It's a thought experiment. No, I would say it's not a thought experiment. It has already been run on Earth because of the independent evolution of landlocked creatures on the continent, Uh, South America, Madagascar, New Zealand, Australia. And uh, we know that our brain went from this Uh, size to this size in in about two or three million years. But in different places? In different places. Well, no, no, not in different places. Ours only went in one. But it could, the analogous thing could, if intelligence were, if human-like intelligence were a convergent feature of evolution, you'd expect that to have happened elsewhere. This this continent that you're on has been evolving about 100 million years by itself. So the kangaroos d- d- didn't go like that. So I would argue, but that's not... You would argue that it's not a conversion feature. I would, because the experiment has already been done that you mentioned. Yeah, and actually that's a, that's a very good point, that the experiment has been done. And when you think about it, you've probably thought about this a lot. I mean, oh my God, the investment in evolving intelligence, the, the payback takes a very, very long time. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you put all these resources in developing a brain that does nothing for you for <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years. It, well, actually what it does for you is make you weaker and <laughs> make uh, your head heavier, less right? able to... Uh, um. All right, so what is, uh, how does knowing the big picture help us figure out who we are? I mean, uh, did you, did you defend the position that knowing who you are is important or is useful to us? I, I, I'm thinking of when I was a teenager, I went to parties, and the people who were the most self-aware were the worst dancers. 
And they, and they so self awareness, in other words, had some negative drawbacks to uh, it. So I'm wondering if that's the same case for us. Uh, I think everyone, uh, in their own way, wonders about you know why we're here, where we came from. I mean, some people, uh, you know, everyone phrases the question differently. Um, Does it make I, you let, let, In fact, let me get, let me give you an example here. So you, the, the picture of Earthrise taken from the moon completely changed our view of planetary stewardship. It, it made us realize that we're in this little lifeboat, and uh, uh, it just completely changed the way we thought about it. I mean, imagine, and this is a hard thing to imagine because, you know, proving a negative is essentially impossible. Imagine that somehow we deduced that intelligent life was rare. Um, uh, you know, that's not going to happen in the next 20 years, but imagine that somehow we, uh, you know, we, we couldn't say we're the only intelligent life in the universe, but imagine that um, uh, we came to establish that intelligent life is very, very rare. Mm -hmm. Don't you think we would, uh, I mean, treat... We, we, there would be a certain reverence for, oh my goodness, we can't destroy ourselves. And uh, we've got to take care of this planet. Maybe we want to populate other planets. Now, whether or not that is good or bad, I'm not, I'm not going to judge it, but it, I think that, that knowing about the universe gives you your context. So if you felt that you were unique and the only Michael Turner in the universe, you would go further out of your way to preserve yourself. Well, I, I wouldn't want to get at that personal, but uh, I think that, well, I, I would just give the example of Earthrise, okay. <laughs> uh, shot from the moon. That started, many people say that started the environmental movement, the awareness, oh my goodness, this, this is a fragile planet. The, the picture that doesn't seem to have gotten as much attention um, uh, is the one that the, uh, the, is taken from the space station or from uh, the shuttle and it, any, anybody who goes in space is a picture of the Earth's atmosphere, how mm. thin it is. Yes. Hey, you've seen that. Yes, yes, I, I mean, in fact, it's so thin that you... Hard to see. In fact, that's it. probably <laughs> why... It, 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 I mean, at least when you look at Earthrise, mm -hmm. you know, you can see the Earth. But the Earth's atmosphere, you know, when you look at it, uh, you just can't even see it. And Does that make you not want to take a trans-Pacific flight and put a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere and come to conferences like this? Well, I want to take a trans-Pacific <laughs> flight to get home and... <laughs> Uh, I think it does, um, yes, I mean, I think it, um, it says that we ought to pay attention, uh, to planetary stewardship, that, um, uh, we're, uh, we've reached the point where we are impacting, the human impact on the planet is measurable, and, uh, can change the way how about if I, I was the head of a super duper agency and I had a hundred billion dollars, I said, I'm going to give it to you and you have, under the condition that you have to try to answer this question, are we alone? What would you do with this money? Oh, are we alone? Well, um, probably not. Oh, you, I mean, actually you're, you're saying, what would I do that we're not doing now? No, not necessarily. Would you continue? Would you just do more of that or would you do something different or what would you do? I think that um, this is a very exciting time in the uh, in this in this quest for finding life elsewhere in the planet in in the uh, universe um, because we have so many different ways to look. So uh, we can explore the solar system, and uh, there are many different environments. And I think it's unlikely that we will find advanced civilizations elsewhere in our solar system, but. Uh, it may even be unlikely that we will find life currently existing elsewhere in the solar system, but I think it's pretty. I think it's not unlikely that we would find evidence that there was once life somewhere else in our solar system. So that's just one. So digging holes on Mars. Uh, digging holes on Mars, visiting. I forget what uh, you know. Europa. Yeah, whatever the favorite planets are for look. Just looking just about anywhere. Um, the uh, then the uh, exoplanets, the planets that orbit other stars. Uh, oh my goodness! So um, thousands of them. 
many in the habitable zone. Uh, we will uh, be able to develop instruments to image those planets and look at their atmospheres and look at telltale tell -tell signs for life. Then you go to SETI, which is kind of the throw deep. I mean, SETI, on the one hand, is like so stupid. I mean, it's like, what are the chances? And in science, you know this as well as I do, there, are, there have been a number of things. In fact, I'll give you the, you know, the best example um, is automated supernova searching. Um, everyone, all the experts knew that it wouldn't work, that you couldn't register the images and subtract them and look for supernovae. Well, good old Saul Perlmutter was so stupid that he didn't know. I think Richard Muller was the one who was well, the Well, you know, that whole group there <laughs> of physicists didn't know. They were too stupid to know that it was impossible, mm -hmm. so they tried it, and it turned out that it was easy. Right, right. It wasn't even hard. It was easy. And so, you know, SETI is that example where, you know, it, it seems it's a throw deep, it's, uh, uh, you know, it seems unlikely, but you've got, so you have SETI, and so you go on and on. Um, uh, actually, you were mentioning, you're more an expert on this than I am, is that, you know, so you're talking about different continents and, you know, different systems here. Could we ever figure out that life started more than once here? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, or maybe that, that, that how, question may have been already answered. Well, how about, how about looking for nano-aliens with microscopy? I mean, nano. talk of nano-aliens. These are aliens that are made out of 10,000 atoms or something, and they're yeah. everywhere, and we haven't noticed them yet. Yeah. Well, that comes to the definition of life, uh, mm. which I, I'm, you know, this is not my expertise, and it's, it, it's so fun because if you put together, I don't, is there a universally accepted definition of life? I would say no. I would say yeah. no. I, I, I would. People I, pretend there are there are some definitions, yeah. but uh, I would say no. How uh, about how about the idea of on the opposite end, macro aliens? In other words, uh, like you have a brain made out of I don't know maybe a hundred billion cells in your neuron neurons, and one of those neurons is part of your brain, yeah. but that individual neuron probably doesn't know it's part of the brain. Yeah. So m maybe we are part of some life form in that sense. We don't know we're a part of. Yeah. Can you suggest well, that, any scientific way to address that? I don't know how to address that. Um, that is one of my favorite uh, questions, is that uh, I think that we would all agree that a dog cannot understand quantum mechanics. And so I asked a neuroscientist, why can't a dog understand quantum mechanics? And mm -hmm. the neuroscientist said, well, I don't understand quantum mechanics. Mm, right. <laughs> but there are humans who do. So, and it's the prefrontal, prefrontal lobe. A prefrontal lobe. Okay, it's all in the uh, prefrontal lobe. Okay. And, but, so it's, it's, you know, so are we, so we have a prefrontal lobe, but maybe to understand the universe, or to maybe to understand that we're actually part of a larger being, we need a pre-prefrontal. Oh, yes. And so oh. there are limits to our understanding. Um, the genetic uh, manipulators have some work to do then, to give us a pre-prefrontal. Well, I, yeah, I, I, and so uh, uh, you're right. I mean, we don't know the grand... Picture. How about Boltzmann brains? Some people have said there's a problem with Boltzmann brains because we have an eternal eternity ahead of us and we have vacuum fluctuations. Surely most observers would then be Boltzmann brains. But if there were, wouldn't that make them aliens as well? That would make them aliens, wouldn't they? Does they would they fall into the category of aliens? Yeah, so this third bucket out here for <laughs> wild speculation, which is very, very important. I mean, because... <laughs> How do the other buckets get fed? You mm. start out with a, an idea that's too silly and too crazy to be true, and most of them are too silly and too crazy to be true, and some of them do pan out. Mm. And so there is this issue of creating a universe, and once you start thinking about creating a universe, you think about the price of creating a universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my really lowbrow understanding of the Boltzmann brain is that, you know, if you're in the business of creating universes... Why create the universe? You know, just create the brain that thinks it sees mm. a universe. So simulate a universe. Yeah, and uh, you know, and then Max Tegmark has this book, you know, that, that which I think is sort of trivial, but um, it is interesting. Every person in science will tell you that the language of math, language of science is mathematics, mm -hmm. and no one has really answered that. You know, nobody has a good answer, and so Max's answer 
uh, and sometimes the, the stupid trivial answer is right, is, well, the reason that it appears that the, the language of science is mathematics is because we are, we are a computer simulation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of people believe, seem to believe, I was surprised George Smoot, I heard a lecture that he gave my PhD advisor, he said, oh yes, he was, he was convinced that we were a part of a simulation. Now, simulations, however, come in different uh, price ranges. You can do, or you can do two different things. One is you can, like in computers, you can either plant, like life form, you can plant the seed and have it grow, in which case, you know, you don't need to invest much money in it, or you can build like a corn plant or build like a, a brand. So there are two ways to do simulations. One is to plant a seed and let it grow, which is pretty easy, or it doesn't cost as much, but a lot of initial research into how to make that seed. And the other is to construct it. And so I'm thinking uh, maybe there's this, Maybe all simulations can be divided into these categories, or what do you think? Do you think we're living in a simulation now? Um, I'm not even sure what that means. I okay. mean, it, what could it at, mean? At a trivial level, we are, uh, in the sense that if you uh, buy into the fact that the universe has laws of physics yes. and that uh, everything has to obey these laws, well, that's what a simulation is. Is a simulation is a set of rules, and then you run it, mm -hmm. and so at some trivial level, we are a simulation uh, because there's, there's rules that the physical world have to follow. We call them the laws of physics. And so therefore, we evolve. And uh, of simulation, there was somebody who, or something that did the simulating. Well, we're, I don't know if you've... Um, I was saying in a trivial sense we're a simulation, but you're saying, okay, well, if that's really true, then you don't really need to waste the whole physical world on it. You just, you know represented on a computer so we you know uh, uh, Charlie Lineweaver doesn't need to be uh, you know 80 kilograms of, of biology we can represent him on a computer with, mm -hmm. with um, so you know and science is interesting because um, different questions attract the interest of different people uh, so that question doesn't really attract my interest <laughs> okay. as you as okay. told All and, right. but it, it's also different questions are ripe at different times and uh, so that question may not be ripe right now. So let's talk about this wonderful scientific story of Genesis that we've put together over the last hundred years or so. Could you tell us it in three minutes? I think so. I mean, I think, um, so the universe is expanding. Um, and because it's expanding, that means it was smaller in the past. The universe has a temperature. Uh, and systems that expand cool, so that means it was hotter in the past. And so we can trace things back with our understanding of the laws of physics. Uh, I would say the, our reliable point is back to quark soup at a microsecond. And it's lumpy quark soup, so it's not quite smooth soup, it has little lumps in it. And given that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old, that's pretty impressive. And you track it back to that time, and it's, I don't know, 10 to the 13 times smaller than it is today. And so that's the part of the universe I would put in bucket number one. That These are things we know that aren't going away. This is after baryogenesis? Um, yeah. So now uh, it, it, it's slightly lumpy. Uh, there are more quarks in the soup than anti-quarks. Um, it's a very smooth quark soup, but it has lumps in it at the level of 0.001%. And so that now opens up a question about where did the lumpy quark soup come from, and why were there more quarks than anti-quarks. And so that kind of moves us into bucket number two. We have some very good ideas that have not been established yet. And uh, so one idea is we think uh, that the, the lumpy quark soup came from something called cosmic inflation, uh, a very rapid expansion driven by something that, you know, we have a name for but not good equations, false vacuum energy, and that, that decay of that false vacuum energy gave you the quark soup, um, gave you the lumps from quantum fluctuations. Um, and of course, one really important thing is that if there weren't, um, at that microsecond time, if there weren't more quarks than antiquarks, then as the universe cooled down, the quarks and antiquarks would, would pair up and annihilate, leaving no 
quarks to make the atoms that we're made out of. Right. And so we also have uh, a very compelling story. Uh, unfortunately, it's not well. It's not not much facts to back it up. That you know, if uh, here's today and here's the microsecond is early on. Um, we think that the universe evolves more matter than antimatter, more quarks than antiquarks. Uh, and that's essential because if there weren't more quarks than antiquarks, then as the universe cooled uh, and, and aged, got older than 10 to the minus uh, a microsecond, um, uh, we, we want to have a few extra quarks so that uh, all the antiquarks annihilate, leaving a little bit of matter. So how did that happen? Now, now when you say quarks, you could also say leptons and antileptons, right? Um, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we the two are connected. But at the end of the day, I think it's simpler just to talk about the quarks okay. because we do want to have neutrons and protons, and and uh, uh, the leptons will come along for the ride. Okay. So. Um, the hints that we've gotten are that the laws of physics uh, are, are slightly favor matter over antimatter. So they, they're not identical for matter and antimatter. And we call that CP violation. That was discovered in 1967 by uh, Jim Cronin and Val Fitch. And we found that the laws of physics have these slight, slight they're, they're almost matter, antimatter indifferent, but th there's a slight preference. Uh, in fact, I can't even really say it's for matter, but there's a slight difference in the laws of physics uh, at, at about the 0.1% uh, level. So you, uh, when Jim Cronin discovered this, uh, he instantly said, I bet that has something to do with why the universe mm -hmm. has matter and not equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Uh, Andrei Sakharov, um, uh, in, a, in an amazing paper that no one understood, and people thought it was a April Fool's joke. Uh, I forget what year it was, 1967 or 68, mm -hmm. uh, very shortly after this was discovered, said, look, if you have a universe where um, um, three things have to happen, you can evolve more quarks and antiquarks. So number one, you need this arrow. Uh, you need a preference for matter over antimatter, CP violation. Number two, um, this the number of quarks can't be, the net number of quarks can't be conserved. So that's called baryon number uh, non-conservation. That's B equals zero or something? Or? Well, no, no, no. You have to be able to change the baryon number. Oh. Uh, and the ordinary reactions we have in the universe today don't change the balance between quarks and antiquarks. So if you take the number of quarks minus the number of antiquarks, today that number doesn't change. But to, to evolve a universe with more baryons than antibaryons, you, you need that to change. And then you need a universe that's not in thermal equilibrium. And as the universe expands, it's not, it doesn't have enough time to stay in thermal equilibrium. So that was a very important paper, and uh, we now believe that uh, this baryon number, or the number of quarks minus the, the number of antiquarks is not conserved. Uh, we uh, we have no evidence for well actually we have no evidence for that, uh, but we uh, we have strong mathematical uh, belief that that's not conserved and so uh, and we ha we know that uh, CP is violated, so we have this story that we call baryogenesis. Now let me let me interrupt you. Yeah, it's an interesting story, but let's try to try to get a time frame on it. You said my, at a microsecond it. Between now, 13.8 billion years... So it's got to happen before a microsecond. Before a microsecond. And be after the Planck time? Or when exactly did this so happen? And I don't think... It, is, it would have to happen after inflation. After we inflation. Don't, we don't know when inflation took place. Okay, so it so, might be Planck scale or gut scale. Well, so it, actually we do know that inflation uh, took place... Uh, we don't know when it took place, but we knew, know that it could not happen could have happened earlier than 10 to the minus 38 seconds. Okay, 10 to the minus 38 so to 10 to the minus 6. 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 6. That's 32 orders of magnitude. Three, well, but if you... It's a pretty small amount of time. <laughs> yeah, small amount of time, but it's a large number of degrees... I mean, the magnitude. So then the other, the other issue is... So you alluded to this earlier. So what are the details? Um, so originally, 
uh, one of the first papers I wrote was about baryogenesis. Mm -hmm. We thought it had to do with grand unified theories, and you evolve a baryon asymmetry, and and. Uh, but you wrote a couple of papers on uh, electroweak scale uh, and baryogenesis. But the, what's changed is that um, the standard model of particle physics, so the stuff that's in bucket number one for particle physics, includes that baryon number plus lepton number. The mm. sum is violated. Mm. So that changes the whole story. So uh, physics that we know about that happened when the universe was about 10 to the minus 12 seconds old, physics that involves the W and the Z bosons and the Higgs, so stuff we really are pretty confident happen, violate B plus L. So I don't want to delve deep into the mathematics, but it now means that there's a very clever way that the universe could have gotten its baryon number, which is to first get a lepton number, and the simplest way to get a lepton number is to get more neutrinos than antineutrinos, uh -huh. and then the uh, standard model physics, when the universe is about 10 to the minus 12 seconds old, morphs that lepton number into a baryon and a lepton number, oh. and now let's just talk simple talk, more quarks than anti-quarks. Right. We avoid the annihilation catastrophe, we have atoms, and so we can make chemical elements and humans. <laughs> okay, now is that your three-minute version of the scientific story of Genesis? Well, that's the three-minute story of the of of getting atoms, okay. Okay. and and it's not it's in bucket two, so it's knocking at the door. We don't have all the details. That's not something we can say. That's not something where I would say a hundred years from now, that'll be there. A hundred years from now, we will still say the universe is expanding. Here's a slightly theoretical question from somebody who doesn't understand quantum mechanics very well. Now I know that in Hilbert space, you define an electron as a wave function. And that wave function has a peak somewhere, and you use real numbers in Hilbert space, and so that peak has an exact position. Is that right? Well, so in quantum field theory, you don't really think of particles. There's a field that represents the electron. Right, but if it's in a, some and, kind of barrier, some, some type of... Uh, and so the field, where the field is big, you well. have electrons and yeah. so on. It's, it's more or less what you say. What, what, the point I'm trying to get is, is it the case that we you, we use real numbers to describe a certain position for some aspect of this wave function, like the peak of it in, if it's in a well? Now, if that's the case, then the probability of that electron being at exactly the position it is is zero. Why is that? Because it's an infinite precision. We're using, it's at, instead of zero to one, it's like 0 0.6543543. In other words, if we have an infinite number of digits that describe the position of the peak of this, elect, the, this uh, wave function, then the probability of that particular electron described by this wave function is at being at that position is zero. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not quite understanding. I mean, in quantum mechanics, um, we can only describe probabilities, correlations, and mm -hmm. um, uh, and of course you know about the uncertainty principle that you know if you uh, uh, th there are pairs of conjugate variables where if you know one very well, mm -hmm. uh, then you know the other one poorly. So I'm not quite I don't know what trap you're trying to set for No, me no the, the, the trap I'm trying to set is there's a, this delta x, delta p in the uncertainty yeah. principles, but before we make a measurement to determine what, how small that delta x is going to be, we use Hilbert space, we use a, a, a wave function to describe these things and do calculations. And we use real numbers, and that means we're using essentially digits with an infinite precision. And I'm wondering if there's a one-wave function with its peak here, one-wave function with its peak here, and I can make them arbitrarily close together and still have different electrons. Is that, does that make any sense at all? It, what you're saying does not make any okay. sense. Okay, all right. So I think, I think that we, um, all right. our, our uh, you know, quantum field theory uh, is the way, I mean, the, the, the cheap version or the elegant version of quantum field theory is... Um, there is only one electron. There is only one field that describes the electron. And that field uh, describes the probability that you would have an electron here or there, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that the, the mechanics of, of quantum field theory is extraordinarily well tested, particularly when we're talking about electrons. So uh, the, uh, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron is a really is something that can be calculated 
uh, according to quantum field theory, by the rules of quantum field theory, to I forget how many digits, ten digits, hmm. and you measure it and it agrees. And so we have a very we have very uh, uh, capable way of, of talking about particles uh, in oh, the universe. Okay, let's talk about the multiverse. Tell me uh, what okay. you think of the multiverse. Uh, the multiverse gives me a headache. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think we started this interview by talking about what science is all about. So, uh, you know, science is all about describing the physical world. Scientific theories have to be falsifiable. Um, we're not, in science, it's not what the coolest theory is. It's what the theory is that describes the world that we live in. And um, so the multiverse is very cool. Uh, the multiverse is a very big idea. Uh, the multiverse, you know, when you, you know, of course, the multiverse is that the universe is made of these disconnected pieces, and is infinitely larger than we would imagine. The multiverse is unbelievably seductive because if you were betting, if you were a betting man or woman, would you bet that the universe is bigger than we currently think, or smaller than we currently think? If you look at history, the universe has been getting bigger and bigger. The multiverse. Could, is a candidate for the most important idea since Copernicus. So why does it give me a headache? It's not testable. And so if it's not testable, it's not science. And our brand is really, really important. What differentiates us uh, from uh, you know, philosophers, theologians, is that we don't care about how cool the ideas are. We just care about whether or not they, it's the way the universe runs and whether or not our ideas are testable. And the multiverse is not testable. So it gives you a headache. <laughs> and so it gives me a headache because it may be the most important idea. Someday it may be testable. But what's really bad about the multiverse is unlike string theory, so string theory gives a lot of people headaches. It does not give me a headache. People call it pathological science because you can't test it today. But in principle it's testable. Whereas the multiverse, at least the way it's formulated, in principle is not testable because these different pieces of it are disconnected and if you live in this piece, you can't access that piece. Well, I think Lee Smullen pr provided a test, for, a potential test for the multiverse um, idea, as, as in you differentiate all of the constants to see if they m maximize the number of black holes that are produced because your universes are produced inside of each other by producing black holes. Um, so he has a nice little story that claims that it's testable, uh, but I think there's a general consensus that uh, his story is more of a fairy tale than science. How about the origin of the laws? I mean, I often talk to physicists, and they're very rarely do they ever want to think about the origin of the laws of physics. Kind of like you ask somebody who goes to church every day and, and says, what about the God did it, God did it. Well, who, how, what created God? And then the Christian will say, oh, you're not allowed to talk about that. So physicists often are in the situation of being a true believers of We're not allowed to talk about the origin of the laws. Is that, how do you think about this? I, yeah, I, I would, um, with, with a couple of, ex I mean, we certainly do think about the laws, but my version of physics is we're the little kid watching the chess game trying to figure out the rules. And of course, we're slightly more than the little kid because we do experiments, but bear with me. Uh, right. And so the little kid can figure out the rules of chess. And, you know, so the little kid has watched a bunch of games or tries to play a game, you know, and somebody slaps his hand when he makes a bad move and, you know, an illegal move. And so in a finite amount of time, the little kid will figure out the rules of chess. And then, of course, his next question is, where did those rules come from? Mm -hmm. And so you and I both know where they came from. Actually, we probably don't know the name of the person, but we know that somebody invented them. They were just arbitrary. Right, and but, so, but in your analogy, the Big Bang would be when the chess game started or when the chess rules were... were no, it's when, it's when the chess game started. And well, so, well, then the rules existed before. Yeah, and so that's why I'm saying that I think that um, um, certainly the view that goes back to, you know, the, the birth of science, uh, you know, the big scientific revolution around the time of the Enlightenment is that there are laws of physics. Um, we're not going to do the, you know, it, the, the issue of the creator became who is the initiator. 
Um, and I, I think this is a really, so I'll just give you an example. There is no experiment that I know of that we can do that differentiate bet between God creating the laws of physics and the laws of physics being created uh, and our universe being created by a uh, college freshman in a very advanced universe in, in, a, in a laboratory course where their laboratory experiment is to create a universe and see what happens. And so and there are there are there other fingers on that. The one yeah. is the god. One is the freshman in advanced civilization. Is there another? Is just they just happen or something? Or? Well, the I mean, it's uh, my my fr my good friend Lawrence Krauss wrote this book, uh, the Universe from Nothing, mm -hmm. and I forget who first turned this phrase, but the phrase is in his book is that uh, nothing is unstable. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what does that even mean? It sounds really good. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the, the string theorists, uh, way back when, in the 80s, um, imagined, and Murray Gelman, I, I think, was, was, this was very much his dream. Uh, and it seems a bit crazy now, particularly after what we know about string theory, is that maybe there would only be one self-consistent theory that could explain the laws of physics. Uh, that seems really crazy now. Einstein asked that question. So Einstein asked the question, in fact it's more or less the question you said is, did God have a choice in the mm -hmm. laws of physics? Mm -hmm. Now the multiverse is really an interesting answer to that. See, we keep coming back to the multiverse which gives me a headache. Uh, is that, depending what version about the multiverse you're talking about, is that you could try all the rules. So, you know, there's nothing special about our set of rules. It's just our set of rules, and all rules were tried, and most of them were really dumb rules, or, and I don't even, you know. But what does that mean, all rules? Is there a probability distribution for the speed of light in this, uh, on this multiverse? I, I don't know. I mean, in fact, that's the, that's the uh, uh, there are no rules for the multiverse. And um, so I think, that, you know, physics at least as practiced for the last 500 years, I think there's been a tacit agreement, uh, you know, it's a really big deal that there are laws of physics. That's a really big deal. They seem to be the same everywhere and at all times. And we've occupied ourselves with trying to figure out that rules, kind of saying, you know what, uh, we no longer need God to run the universe, uh, but we need an initiator and we'll put that one aside. We we got lots to work to do. We got some stuff where we can make progress, but the initiator um, and where the rules came from, one we'll put that aside for a while. How, how about the idea that it's a little like the multiverse, but maybe different? And that is that um, you know, in internal inflation, you have a universe here, a universe here, a universe here. When people ask me about the multiverse, I say, well, we don't have a theory that combines quantum mechanics with general relativity, but we know that quantum mechanics has to deal with statistics. It doesn't deal with unique events. So if you have a theory that's based on quantum cosmology, which we think we will need whenever we understand the universe, early universe better, we will have something that tells us about the statistics of universes, therefore strongly suggesting or at least suggesting that there are other universes. What do you think about that? So I think that's slightly different. I think you're right, it's not unrelated, but it's slightly different because uh, you're now talking about a wave function for the universe that would describe how the universe could have turned out. But the multiverse really says there are these different universes. It's not a distribution of how it could have happened. There are a distribution there there are these separate universes that are disconnected. So I think that's logically different than just saying, oh, the universe should be described by a wave function. And uh, How about the many worlds version of interpretation of quantum mechanics from Hugh Everett? Is that different again? Well, so again, it's, it's different but not unrelated. And, of course, th there used to be, uh, what's his name, uh, Don Page. Uh, I think he so still if exists. You really, <laughs> if you take those different pieces you know, those different worlds of the wave function seriously, then you would not be a play, afraid to play Russian roulette because even even if you got the bullet mm -hmm. in in this part of the wave function, mm -hmm. you know, if it's, you know, six chambers and one bullet, there's five other places where you're alive. And no one takes that seriously enough to bet their life on it by committing it's, suicide. It, 
No one has left a note. Thank God, no one has taken. <laughs> no one has taken that. No, no one has the courage of their convictions to take that seriously. Okay. How about the How about the entropy problem? Now, you and I are talking. The entropy of the universe is increasing. The the sun is shining. So the entropy of the universe is going up and up and up. That means the universe had to start out at a lower entropy. Is that a problem? Roger Penrose has thought this is an incredibly important problem. And uh, I've talked to Paul Davies. uh, I've thought about this myself, about, well, if if there's an entropy associated with gravity and matter is homogeneously distributed, then the entropy is low. And if that's a natural outcome of inflation, then that solves the initial entropy problem. What do you think of these ideas? Well, I think um, I think right now they're fragmentary ideas uh, in in the following sense that um, we cannot we don't have a we don't have a self consistent way of describing the, <coughs> excuse me the thermodynamics of a self gravitating system. We have bits and pieces of it so that you can try to throw throw an argument together. But we don't have a self-consistent way of describing entropy uh, in a self-gravitating system. And so that kind of means there's no rules and you can get any kind of answer you want. Do we know even the sign when I drop a ball and something collapses, P of K you know, goes up, does that, is that entropy going up or entropy going down? Um, well, I mean, if you do all of your experiments in this room, mm. even if the room is really big, as mm. big as the galaxy... Um, uh, and, and you take that to be your system, and you can define that to be a closed system, then the usual thermo- thermodynamics applies. But once you allow, once you allow uh, gravity to come into play, and then this goes back uh, to, the, to the biggest problem in uh, gravitational systems have negative specific heat. So as they cool off, as they lose energy, they get hotter. Mm. And so that, that's Pathological. Pathological. That seems like it's normal. Uh, well, normally when a system loses energy, it cools off. Well, that's if you're kinetically dominated, but if you're gravitationally dominated, right, then... right, and that's we don't have a uh, uh, well, we don't we don't have a self consistent way of describing the thermodynamics of a self gravitating system. Hmm. And you, th- you think that's a problem? Should we have one? Um, well, that's. That's a really interesting question because, th- in my, from my point of view, which uh, yeah, I don't think it's the only point of view, is that thermodynamics is not a fundamental science. It's a clever way of describing uh, very large systems. So physicists are incredibly clever, right? So we we simplify. You know, you know what reductionism is. If you go look at Wikipedia, reductionism is you take a duck and you divide it into its pieces. And by taking a complicated system and looking at the smaller pieces, the smaller pieces are simple, simpler, and you can understand the whole thing. And uh, so, uh, let's see where, what were. <laughs> it sounds like you're not going to understand how to make a quack by cutting it and putting cutting it. Well, pieces. so well, there is an issue. So reductionism has been wildly successful, but it doesn't mean that reductionism will solve every problem. So, for example. Uh, a system of many, many particles. Physicists, I mean, we can describe two particles, we can describe three. When you get many, many, it's very hard to describe. So, uh, what to me, what thermodynamics or statistical mechanics is, is a convenient way uh, to set up a new set of variables to describe the system. It's not fundamental rules. It's just a trick. Well, I shouldn't say a trick, but it's a mathematical scheme for describing a system with with lots of particles where you're not interested in the what any one particle is doing you're just interested in the bulk pro, uh, the bulk properties of the system and so there's no reason to believe that that approach has to work for every system okay let me ask you another question that is has to do with identity and the self-awareness issue and whether <laughs> knowing whether you're what what role you have, you fulfill in the universe, what role you play or how you fit into the universe, is that useful or not? Now, Harriet Tubman, who ran the Underground Railroad, said, uh, you know, I saved a thousand slaves, I could have saved a thousand more if they knew that they were slaves. So in other words, the self-identity of the slaves in the South were, of not being slaves, were preventing them from being freed. And uh, so I'm wondering if when we come to know more and more and more about our role in the universe, 
will that free us in any way or will that be bad news for us? I was talking to Paul Davies earlier about this and he said, well, there are some myths that we should hold on to because the truth is just, to, you know, will undermine our existence or not be good for us. What is your take on that issue? Um, I don't worry about it a lot. You know, but actually, <laughs> I, you know, if, if you, uh, I, I like Paul's point of view on it that, um, well, it, it it's the it's the uh, what was that movie with Jack Nicholson? You can't take the truth. <laughs> uh, it was a it was a well uh, Nicholson. I don't know if he got an Academy Award, but uh, he was he was a military officer who did things that people didn't like, but he would say had to be done. And mm -hmm. he told the people at the court martial trial interrogating him that you can't take the truth. And that's kind of <laughs> yes. what Paul Davies is saying yes. is. The truth is so brutal that we are, we have no point. All right, well, that's what the, the famous line from Steve Weinberg's uh, book, you know, the more, the more we find out about it, the more pointless it seems. Do you yeah. have a reaction to that? or? Um, no. I mean, I, I think <laughs> that, that tells you more about Steve Weinberg than it tells you about the universe. I, and I have enormous respect. But he, he you know what, he, he, he talked about that later, and he said, you know what, it, if you suspect... If you expect there to be a point, I mean, that is about yourself. That is about your expectations. Um, on the other hand, we're finding out more and more about, for example, whether you have free will or not. We're all walking around thinking we have free will, and if we find out somebody says, all right, here's definite proof, you no longer have free will, you know, are we going to still think, uh, you know, are we going to believe in our that we're making choices still or not? In other words, this is science is incredibly powerful, and if we find out more and more about how we fit into, you know, what part, what role we have, then that can undermine a, a, almost everything we have about our self-identity. Well, this is what I think the value of science is. It sets the context. And I would say that um, in thinking about these deeper issues, you know, the relation, you know, the, the, you know, why the relationship between human beings, how human beings behave, how we treat our environment, this and that, that, um, Science, that's not within the realm of science. That's not plumbing. But we inform that. We inform that discussion. For example, um, I think free will is maybe too complicated, but what we've, learned, what we've learned about the universe, what we've learned about human beings, what we've learned about evolution has informed the conversation. So knowing that we evolved from simpler animals... Um, you know that I, I suspect that did not make a lot of people happy, and that that some of the uh, some of the stories for our purpose to exist had to go away, but it informed the conversation, and it, uh, and it and that's kind of what science is all about. Is it's not about who runs the universe; it's about how the universe runs, and that's what we do exquisitely well. And, uh, you know, again, I come back to this plumber thing. Um, I kind of punted on all your hard questions, is we're plumbers. You know, if you have psychological problems, go get a, psycholo uh, go get a wait, psychologist. Wait, 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 let me correct. Aren't you a theoretical plumber? I'm a, well, <laughs> I was using a, a metaphor here. So. Well, yeah, but the whole idea of yeah. your story is that plumbers have a very well, app they're applied, right? No, but, they're different kinds of plumbers. And, <laughs> yeah. and what, I, what I was saying is that plumbers do one thing really well, and we do one thing really well, mm. which is to figure out how the universe runs. And that informs, what's valuable about that is that informs everything else. So, for example, it inform, let's come to religion. So you've been dancing around religion here. Let's imagine that we find evidence for intelligence life elsewhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. That really informs, I mean, first of all, that's really interesting, but that informs religion because there's a whole bunch of religious questions that come up. So was, did Christ come to their planet? Did Muhammad come to their planet? Uh, do, they have some, do they have holy books and do their holy books look like our holy books? And... Uh, so science provides the facts that inform the conversation. Okay, now you use the pronoun they rather than it, assuming that this is very common that people, when they talk about aliens, they talk about aliens with an S, not the alien or it. So do you have any reason for that? Actually, I'm not even quite sure what you said. Uh, you said, oh, they, you said they, they, they. You didn't say it, it, it. 
it, it, and it's a singular would be it, and plural is they, and you use they, they, they all the time, and everybody does that. Would you have any reason for that? Just convention? Uh, just convention. Okay, it might be a big, well, it might be a big it out there, for example. I, for example, you're made out of cells, I could say they, they, yeah. they, or I could just call you it, the, the person that you are, the yeah. single larger entity. Okay, and uh, how about jokes? Do you have any uh, astrobiology jokes, origin of the universe jokes? Origin, no, I don't. <laughs> I've got Bill Clinton jokes. I've got, uh, <laughs> I've got, uh, yeah. What other good jokes? Do have you talked to Wheeler? Did you ever meet Wheeler? Oh yeah. yeah. And uh, do you have any Wheeler stories? That I mean, he thought about a lot of these deep issues. Uh, yeah, I don't really have any good Wheeler stories. But did he uh, agree with most of the things you've just said, or uh, what do you think? I actually don't know. I mean, I think many physicists really. Uh, fall into the plumber camp that uh, we stick to our lane. Well, John Wheeler is known for going out of his lane, right? Well, it depends what you define. I'm talking about the scientific lane. Uh -huh. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not actually uh, that aware of, of, I mean, did he speculate about life elsewhere in the universe and the purpose of, of well, life? Well, he's had uh, some type of self-referential you and I and I don't know. Oh, okay. I, well, I'm not aware. So that, so that, Maybe I'm, uh, you know... Uh, you studied the GR. You read Misner, Thorne, Wheeler, but that's about as far. How about, uh, you went to Caltech. Was yeah. Feynman there when you were there? Oh, yeah. Did I, you have I, him as a teacher? Oh, I, I did a, uh, a, uh, a one -on one tutorial for him, with him for a quarter. How was that? Um, oh, it was unbelievable. I mean, he, he had such a clever mind and... and uh, you know, uh, taught me the quark model without me really knowing it was the quark model, and and I think he, I'm influenced enormously by Feynman, and you know his book. You probably, if you know about Feynman, you know his book called The Character Physical Law, mm -hmm. and so I, I put myself in that camp, and he's really interested uh, in figuring out what the rules of the game are, and the the chapter that he has in it that's sort of the most speculative, the most that goes in the direction you're talking about is to to uh, talk about what happens when we know all the physical laws. Mm -hmm. You know, when we figure out all the rules of the game. And in that final chapter, he talks about the philosophers coming in um, and now trying to explain why the laws are the way they are, which is something that you cannot test. Mm -hmm. And so I think he would... I guess I put myself in his, in his camp where we stay in our science lane, we stay in our science brand, we're really good at that. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. And we're not so good, I'll speak for myself, I'm not so good in those other lanes. And well, did, he, did Feynman ever talk about aliens at all? The no, Fe no, no, no. Fermi paradox? Uh, well, the fer so Fermi paradox, I think that's science. It's an interesting... I mean, I, uh, the, the paradox is, uh, what I t always tell my students is the most important thing in science is to ask a question. Most questions are the wrong questions. Most questions are, well, I shouldn't say dumb, but the, they're, they're, not, they're not the right question. But you ask a question and then you refine it. Mm -hmm. And the Fermi paradox is really the best example of that because it's such a rich question and it just bifurcates into... Is it even the right question? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question because it makes you start thinking about the time scales for evolution. Because underlying what he's talking about is there's one time scale for evolution, which is the biological. Uh, and oh my God, I'm not a biologist, but it's measured in millions or hundreds of millions of years. And then there's the technological time scale, which we know is measured in you know I don't know how you measure it, but it's hundreds of years. It's it's a thousand times different, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, you know, that's at the root of the paradox. Uh, and it allows you, it asks, you know, it asks the question, and it may not even be the right question, but it, but he's looking at this scientifically. So he's not talking about the purpose of life, he's not talking about, he's really looking at it very scientifically. Well, do you have a favorite solution to it? The Fermi paradox being, if, you know, if there are other civilizations out there, they will have plenty of time to have crossed the galaxy uh, 10 to 4 times, 10,000 times in the history of the galaxy, um, even traveling at 10th of the speed yeah, of light. where are they? So where are they? So what is your, so you have a solution, a favorite well, solution, or? The, I mean, there's so many different solutions, and, 
I come back to this one about intelligence. Uh, is it a convergent property of evolution? Mm -hmm. Is that um, I think that the part of his argument that's most plausible, but plausible doesn't mean correct, is that life started a bunch of times in the galaxy. The part of his argument that is plausible, but that doesn't necessarily mean correct, is we weren't the first start. Because if we're the first start, then that resolves the paradox, but that seems very unlikely. Um, and so one possibility is that intelligence is not a convergent property, and so it, the, the galaxy is teeming with life. But, but reason, not like human intelligence. Yeah, yeah, and they didn't develop technology, they're just very, because again, the, our understanding of evolution, or my understanding, which is probably not as good as other people, uh, is that it's all about resources, right? It's not about who's the smartest, it's about surviving and using the resources. And uh, I, I added dominating. I don't even know if it's dominating. I suppose you could develop a, you know, a... Uh, yeah, it's, it's about survival, I guess, not dominating. Now, well, I've asked people about what kind of aliens they would like to find, and some people go for the, oh, I want sexy aliens like Hollywood, and these are usually young men who want to <laughs> have sex with the aliens. Uh, but most people say, oh, I want to have some wisdoms, kind of like a godlike alien who can solve all our problems and tell, solve all the equations of physics or... And other people are more sociologically interested in, well, if they could tell us how to get along with each other. Do you, uh, do you have any emotion? If you close your eyes, turn off your rational part of your brain, and then you just use your emotions to feel this issue, what type of alien would you feel that you would want to find? I'm actually not that interested in aliens. So you're, 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 you're go, you go numb. You're frigid when it comes yeah, to I'm aliens. Yeah, totally frigid. I mean, I'm not that, yeah. yeah. There are other things that, you know, you have to make choices in life. You, you, uh, um, you have to stay in your own track. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. That's, it's different than staying in your own lane. It's, mm. it's, uh, I'm not saying you have to stay, stay in your own lane, but you know this as a scientist, is that you have to make choices. So, for example... Uh, there are all kinds of things you could follow up, all kinds of paths your research could go. And some of them you just say, you know, that one doesn't interest me. Or, I mean, a, a good one that's involved uh, uh, astronomers down here are the time variation of the constants. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, gosh, that seems really important. Not everyone's working on it. Why? You make a decision. You, you make a subjective decision that, you know, I don't think that one's going to pan out. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be the person, I don't want to spend my life proving that they're not changing, because <laughs> okay. I already think that that's probably the case. And All right, how about gravitational waves, primordial gravitational waves? I'm, I'm interested in that because if you knew the temperature of the primordial gravitational waves, you'd know the number of relativistic degrees of freedom between, I guess, the oh, Higgs yeah, yeah. And, the, and the Planck scale. So that would be very, very important. Is When will we know, do you think in 100 years we'll have the gravitational wave detectors oh, sufficient... Sufficiently well, that, accurate. Yeah, you know, I think that one, um, that again is a very, it's interesting about science to ask questions and to, but if you put inflation in there, then it mucks everything up. Is that right? So it's the simple picture. If you didn't have inflation uh, and you had this very simple picture of the universe, which could be right, mm -hmm. um, then by measuring the uh, background of gravitational waves, which is unbelievably hard, uh, harder than measuring the neutrino background by mm -hmm. orders of magnitude, the the payoff at the end of the rainbow is number you know it is number knowing the n number of degrees of freedom. Um, but I think that one we already know there's a counterexample that if inflation took place, then those primordial gravitational waves are gone. They got mm -hmm. inflated away. Oh, I see. And so. Um, they might not even be there. Or... It the, yeah they would they would be there but. but that instead of being one degree, right, right, right. it would be 10 to the minus 60 degrees. I see. So that's a long way off. Okay, let me ask you a final question. So, are we alone? Um, are we alone? No. And why do you think that? Um, I, you know, it's rolling the dice. We get 10 to the 11, uh, 10 to the 11 stars, so that means 10 to the 11 planets in our galaxy. Uh, 10 to the 11 galaxies. Uh, and I didn't tell you what, who our mates are. Our mates could be very boring, single-celled things. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're alone. So I don't think. 
so the we is we other life forms, or we yeah, the life of Earth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And why is this an important question? Oh my goodness! Don't you want to know? I do, but uh, it seems to not. My curiosity doesn't seem to be ubiquitous. Oh, I, th I well, actually, I've not not done any polling on this, but I bet, I bet if you asked a hundred people, uh, are you interested in whether or not we're alone? I mean, you have to. Not everyone understands the question. You'd have to flesh it out a little bit. That I, I would imagine, and I don't know if you've done this, but I, w I somehow would imagine that ninety percent of the people or more would say, "Yeah, I'm interested in that." It's hard to compete with the gender of Kim Kardashian's children. Oh, you know, the, the, uh, I, human beings are really interesting, and it's easy to underestimate the intelligence of human beings, because we all are interested in stupid things, uh, but that doesn't mean we're inter not interested in really interesting things, and, uh, yeah, it it's very. Uh, I think people are interested in this question, uh, even if they're interested in stupid things. I think <laughs> this is a universal. I mean, maybe you have to quiet them, quiet their brain down a little bit, and take away their uh, <laughs> smartphone for a few minutes. And uh, I think people are interested.